Okay, we can get started now. Uh, welcome to the Mutella Foundation Brain Tumor Webinar Series. Our special guest tonight is Dr. Eric Wong, and he'll be speaking about tumor treating fields, progress in the last decade. Take care, Eric. Well, thank you very much, Al. Thank, uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending my talk. I'm Dr. Eric Wong. I'm an, a, an associate professor at Harvard Medical School, and I am a staff neuro-oncologist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. I'm also affiliated with Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center. And what I would like to do today is to talk to you about some of the latest development in tumor treating fields therapy. Here are my disclosures, and I just want to say that I'm a recipient of one of uh, 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 one of Al's uh, Masala grants. So the professor who initially made the observation about tumor treating fields on tumor cells is Dr. Yoram Palti from the Technion University in Haifa, Israel. And what he observed initially was that he saw cells under the influence of tumor treating fields and those cells uh, blow up um, uh, under these fields. And as you can see in the clock here, the clock uh, indicates that this is actually in terms of hours. So this is a speeded up um, uh, fast forward type of uh, picture. And it took about 10 years to make that, to make that into a uh, clinical reality in terms of a device. So this is one of my patients uh, who in 2014 was, participate, was participating in a, a pivotal randomized phase three clinical trial. Um, and uh, he's still alive today and he's working and he is in another clinical trial. So um, the initial approval of tumor treating field was for recurrent glioblastoma and that occurred on April 15, 2011. The second approval was for um, newly diagnosed glioblastoma, and that occurred in, on October 5th, 2015. Now, what I hope to do in the next 45 minutes is uh, to describe to you our improved understanding of tumor treating fields mechanism of action, uh, the Novotel treatment planning procedures, and also some of the computer modeling data as well as to review some of the recent published clinical data and also uh, some of the clinical trials that are currently in operation, as well as uh, some of the uh, clinical trials that are being planned uh, for uh, future investigations. Now, uh, I am an oncologist and I give uh, chemotherapy and biologic agents and, um, and therefore these drugs are within the domain of chemistry. Now, tumor treating fields is administered by a device, and, and therefore, these alternating electric fields is in the domain of physics. So therefore, in order to get a uh, good understanding of how these physical phenomena affect the cell biology of the cell and later on translate into clinical efficacy, we really have to understand the underlying mechanism. So, so that as physicians, we can apply it uh, uh, effectively to patients. So um, uh, tumor treating fields is within a spectrum of devices that are being used to treat cancer. And everyone know about radiation therapy and radiation therapy is operating in uh, the high energy portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. They are in the, um, uh, Ectohertz range, 10 to the 19 uh, uh, powers range. Okay, and there's another device called laser-induced thermal therapy, which operates in the microwave range. Um, and tumor treating fields is um, operating at an even lower frequency, which is in the um, kilohertz range, or at uh, somewhere between 100,000 cycles per second to 300,000 cycles per second. Now, let me just contrast tumor treating fields with radiation therapy. Think of radiation, radiation therapy like a bullet. It, it uh, penetrates through a um, uh, metal sheet and uh, there is a direct effect, but the sharp nail uh, that are um, uh, whipped up by the bullet 
also cause secondary damage, and these are indirect effects. However, when you think of tumor tree in fields, you have to think of it as waves, like waves in the ocean that push these pebbles and sand uh, towards uh, the beach. And uh, there are also direct and indirect effects, and I will go over that uh, later on in my talk. Now, when you um, expose a charge in a static electric field, as in this case, the static electric charge would move towards the opposite charge. However, when you are exposing this to an alternating electric field, uh, the static charge would have no net movements because uh, the polarity kind of switched back and forth and it, uh, the charge would remain in one place. However, uh, in a lot of our cells, um, the proteins inside a cell is made up of dipoles, meaning that one part of the protein molecule is positively charged and another part of the protein molecule is negatively charged. And when we expose these proteins in an alternating electric field, uh, although there's no net translational movement, there is rotational movements or there's tumbling going on uh, due to the alternating electric fields. And when the field is in inhomogeneous, what we see is that there is, is also uh, a little bit of translational movement. And uh, within an inhomogeneous field, there's uh, both rotational and also translational movement. The important point is this. Um, the electric field induces a micromechanical force on charges and dipoles. And if, you are, and if you go to your local children's museum, you can put your hand on the Van der Graaff generator. The electric fields that are generated around your head will levitate your hair because your hair has these charges on it. Um, so, um, if we tune the alternating electric fields to the right frequency, um, we would observe, we would be able to observe a biological effect. And in order to um, tune it right, the tuning frequency is between 100 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz. And in this experiment, it showed that the, uh, there is a 30% decrease in viable cells. And, um, and, this is, uh, and this is glioma cell lines. And, and also the efficacy in terms of um, uh, destroying glioma cells it is also dependent on the tumor treating field intensity. Now, this is not very intuitive because uh, we, don't, we, we cannot see these fields. Uh, we, don't, we can only see the effects of these fields. However, um, there was a phenomenon that was um, uh, seen uh, back in the 1940s, uh, there was a very, very famous phenomenon in which a w an alternating wind actually knocked, knocked down a bridge. So here it is. This is the T Tacoma Narrows Bridge, uh, and it collapsed because it was built within uh, this wind tunnel, and it just so happens that the, um, the frequency was correct uh, uh, that it actually knocked down uh, the uh, bridge. So let me just show this. Uh, One over the USA Tacoma Narrows. From the day it was finished in 19. So as you can see, uh, the bridge uh, kind of uh, oscillates and eventually the bridge uh, collapses. Uh, So, um, so as you can see, uh, we don't intuitively think of wind can knock down a bridge, but in this in this special case, uh, it can actually knock down a bridge because the tune because the frequency was tuned correctly. So, um, uh, so tumor treating fields is actually operating in this part of the cell cycle, uh, and it is operating at anaphase and also telophase. Um, 
which is very, very different from traditional DNA damaging agents such as uh, alkylating chemotherapy and radiation, which operates in the prophase uh, and the G2 and M checkpoint. Um, Taxol is a chemotherapy drug that primarily act activates, uh, works at the metaphase. So uh, this is uh, normal mitosis, and as you can see, that um, uh, what you would see is that as soon as the metaphase uh, chromosome splits, uh, there is uh, also splitting of the cytoplasm. However, uh, within the uh, tumor treating fields, uh, what you see is that uh, the, the cell cannot split into two, but it goes into a violent loving phase. And when the field is not at full strength, you can actually see that the tumor cells actually uh, was able to undergo incomplete but asymmetric cellular segregation in which one, one, one cell has more DNA contents compared to the, the other cells or the mitotic plate was just uh, disrupted. So what it means is this, um, uh, uh, tumor treating fields can also have direct and indirect effects on dividing cells, on dividing tumor cells. And, um, and uh, in the movie, what you see, what, what you see is that uh, septin is a very, very large protein that has a dipole moment of uh, over 2,700 uh, units. Uh, and what you, um, uh, and it is a very, very important protein to uh, split the cell in half. Also, beta tubulin is another important protein that uh, is involved in the mitosis process. And on uh, microscopy, what you can see is that uh, the microtubules are disorganized and there's asymmetric cellular uh, segregation. And also sometimes the cells just cannot uh, segregate in a timely fashion, so they have to reassemble and what you get is a giant cell with four N number of chromosomes, basically a giant cell. And these cells will die within 36 hours and uh, particularly the P53 wild type cells. Now, but there are also a number of indirect effects. Now we know that can add to the efficacy against tumor cells. And one of them is that it can cause increase in plasma membrane permeability. Meaning that uh, on electron microscopy, what you can see is that there are multiple holes on the plasma membrane. And uh, as a result of that, uh, the cellular content or nuclear contents may leak out because of that. Now, um, these holes have a certain size and only uh, up to about uh, 40 kilodalton uh, uh, molecules can only go through these holes. So it's not for everything, uh, but it's only for a certain size of uh, molecules that can leak out. Now, one of the molecules is probably this protein called BRCA1, and everyone is familiar with BRCA1 because this is, this is important in breast cancer. And this is a very important uh, enzyme that repairs double-stranded DNA dam uh, damage. And uh, this was worked on um, uh, by Michael Story at UT Houston, in which he looked at uh, sensitive cell lines and not-so-sensitive uh, not cell lines, and he found that both types of cell lines uh, had a decrease in BRCA1. And, and actually, you can see a more than 50% decrease in the sensitive cell line and uh, uh, about 50% uh, de uh, decrease, less than 50% decrease in, in the less responsive cell line. Now, BRCA1 is, is also localized during mitosis, localized in the my, mitosis apparatus uh, uh, at, uh, associated with tubulin. So there's an association with this disruption and then secondarily damage. Now, I will go back to this a little bit later because um, uh, this is the basis of, of, uh, of uh, tumor treating fields uh, ability to enhance radiation damage. Now, another indirect effect is that uh, tumor treating fields can cause immunogenic cell death. So this is what I mean. Um, uh, when it is applied to cells in culture, uh, it causes stress in the endoplasmic reticulum and uh, cow reticulum, which normally resides at the 
endoplasmic reticulum will be moved to the cell surface, making the cells visible to uh, antigen presenting cells and it kind of sensitizes uh, uh, cytotoxic T cells to mount a robust anti-tumor immune response. So therefore, as you can see, there's a whole host of direct and indirect results uh, as a result of uh, tumor treating fields treatment. So to summarize, uh, tumor treating fields um, primarily affect the cytokinesis part of, my, of mitosis in which uh, the cytoplasm splits. And as a result of that, there's a direct uh, effect which leads to cell death. And, but there are a whole host of indirect effects that can lead to DNA damage, uh, 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 repair deficiency, as well as immunogenic cell death. So uh, how do we apply this therapy to patients? Well. Uh, there is a Novotel uh, treatment planning program, which is a computer planning program based on the location of the patient's tumor, in which uh, we, uh, we uh, determine the best position to apply uh, the electric fields. Now, these arrays, these arrays, so each array has nine of these transducers, and this is rectangular, so one can put, uh, place this on the, onto the patient's head with the long axis either horizontally or vertically. So, um, so uh, the uh, treatment planning program would determine based on the location of the tumor uh, and also the size of the tumor, what is the best combination of these uh, uh, arrays uh, on the patient's head. And uh, uh, the program also takes into account of the patient's uh, uh, head circumference as well. So, uh, so in so in my next patient, uh, the treatment planning program uh, uh, basically said that uh, on her left side of the head, uh, the array should be horizontal. However, th there are times that we have to make um, minor adjustments because of the patient's surgical scar and also uh, uh, some of the wound healing issues. So, in this particular uh, patient because the scar is located uh, right on uh, 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 the middle third um, uh, trans, uh, transducer arrays here. So in order to not to, uh, and at that time her scar was still healing. So, uh, so we have to imp improvise a little bit in, in terms of putting this array diagonally and make sure that the scar falls between uh, uh, two horizontal array lines. And when you take an X-ray of the skull, you will see that there are metal underneath the uh, sutures uh, that was placed uh, at the time, uh, at the end of the craniotomy in which uh, we want to avoid placing these, uh, these uh, uh, transducers above the uh, metallic parts of the skull. So, so this is so. At other times, what we see is that there are, um, uh, particularly during a hot summer months, we see a scalp erythema here. Uh, and when we apply the arrays uh, for a prolonged period of time, we can actually see a, a, a ball spots on the patient's uh, head. And the and and these ball spots doesn't come on immediately. It takes about four to six months uh, when you place uh, the transducers. Uh, repeatedly at the same spot. Now, this is the, re this is the reason, because uh, on electric field modeling, we know that uh, the hottest area is on the scalp. And obviously, when, when you apply this over and over again, you can get erythema and actually um, uh, ball spots. Now, we can also use computer modeling to take a look at the interior of the brain in which uh, we can um, uh, uh, get an appreciation of where the intensity of the field is located. So in this particular case, the tumor is located in the right parietal brain and uh, the highest intensity of the field is actually between the area of the, um, of the tumor and the lateral ventricle. But there are also other areas where the field intensity is very high, such as at the uh, poles of the lateral ventricle and also at the uh, uh, side of the uh, surface of the brain. 
Now, in order to do this type of analysis, this is called finite element analysis. Uh, we have to get the patient's uh, MRI scan. We have to put it through this computer program uh, that uh, uh, automatically segment various structures in the brain. However, we still have to draw in the tumor, also computer programs, and, and eventually we solve it using uh, a, a third computer program to make that work. So what we get is that various uh, structures that are, lab that are labeled as what we call mass, and they are imported into the solving program. And uh, what it comes out is that we can uh, determine slice by slice uh, the location of highest fields and also uh, uh, areas uh, that have uh, lowest fields. And as you can see here, uh, some of the highest fields are located at the cell side on the surface of the brain. The genu of the corpus callosum also has uh, very, very high fields here in the middle. And we can actually quantify this by plotting what we call um, electric field volume histogram, and we can uh, plot, the, uh, the, uh, plot the dose of the tumor, uh, and also uh, the, uh, the amount of energy that's absorbed in, uh, in, that re uh, in that region. Now, a lot, of this, uh, a lot of the energy is absorbed by the scalp and the skull. And uh, Anders Kosu from Denmark has demonstrated that by removing part of the skull, uh, this is done by elect uh, electric field modeling, by finite element modeling, uh, uh, he will be able to increase the penetration of the electric field into the brain, into the underlying brain. And uh, the size of the uh, uh, skull uh, defect uh, that would give um, minimum size that would give uh, the highest penetration is about 50 millimeters. So it's not that large. Uh, so um, so uh, he's planning to uh, uh, take the clinical trials to study this phenomenon. Now the positioning of the arrays also makes a difference in which, uh, so as you can see here, when, the, when a tumor is located along the x-axis here on, on the axial plane, uh, uh, the arrays that are uh, that are placed at 45 degrees uh, would have the biggest efficacy, uh, would, would give rise to, to the highest intensity to, to the tumor. However, if the tumor is located in the right parietal brain, uh, is actually um, uh, uh, the arrays, at, uh, the best arrangement is actually at 15 to 30 degrees. So the positioning of the array matters and also uh, uh, the skull and the scalp uh, matters in terms of uh, 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 tumor treating field penetration in, uh, into the brain. Now, what is the clinical data for efficacy in patients? Well, we know that um, in the EF14 clinical trials, this was the pivotal trial in which uh, patients were randomized two to one, uh, two patients to receive uh, tumor treating fields and temozolomide after initial radiation and temozolomide, and one patient received temozolomide alone. So what he found, what what this trial found was that uh, there was a, both an improvement in progression-free survival and overall survival. And uh, the primary endpoint was actually progression-free survival. Secondary endpoint was overall survival. And there are additional endpoints uh, such as safety, quality of life, and patients were stratified by external resection and also MGMT methylation status. And uh, the two populations were roughly equivalent uh, with a median age in the mid-50s. And obviously, uh, there are fewer women participating in this trial. And this is uh, also what I see in my clinical experience, uh, men. Uh, is, is willing to accept this uh, a lot more easily than women. Uh, uh, roughly about half of the patients uh, had gross toe resection and, uh, and the rest of the um, uh, uh, median time from diagnosis to randomization was uh, just a little bit under four months. And the duration of uh, tumor treating field therapy was about eight, eight months. And the number of cycles uh, was about five, of temozolomide was about five to six months, six cycles. 
Now, the, the MGMT status, the IDH1 status were roughly equivalent. Um, uh, about 40% of the patients were on epileptics. Uh, and notably, about uh, thir- roughly uh, about 30% of the patients were on uh, corticosteroids. I just wanted to point out that corticosteroids uh, is important, and uh, we always want to minimize the amount of corticosteroids that uh, patients with glioblastoma takes. So the reason, and particularly for this type of therapy, because hemotrinine fields has immunomodulatory effects, as you can see earlier. Uh, when I uh, show you evidence that uh, hematrine fields can uh, induce immunogenic cell death. Now, here's the survival data. So there was a planned, pre-planned uh, interim analysis uh, as well as a final analysis and both show the same thing. The uh, progression-free survival increased from about eight months to 11 months and the overall survival increased from about 20 months to about 25 months. So uh, that was uh, the improvement in, in, in uh, both uh, progression-free survival and overall survival were the basis of the Food and Drug uh, Administration's approval. Now, in terms of side effects, uh, they were roughly equivalent, and this was primarily f- uh, from the uh, temozolomyces effects. Uh, the, there are some, but not tremendous, uh, grade three and grade four hematological toxicity, and this is primarily from uh, from the Zolomite itself. Uh, There's some fatigue, some uh, infection, uh, but they are not uh, 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 significant. And uh, patients with uh, with, uh, neurological uh, adverse events, obviously, because uh, this is a neurological disease, there is uh, a little bit more of skin irritation associated with this device. Now, there has been an analysis of dose that was applied to the tumor and compliance on patient survival. And, uh, and the dose is calculated by, again, fin- finite element analysis. And as you can see here, uh, this is the tumor, uh, this is uh, the electric field, uh, uh, heat map. This is the power heat map, and um, and the analysis uh, hinges on two parameters: uh, local minim- minimum fill intensity as well as lo- local minimum power density. And when you look at the power, the amount of power that is applied to patients, if patients get more than 1.15 milliwatt per centimeter cube. Uh, you can see that they have a uh, better uh, overall survival and progression-free survival. And if their compliance is greater than 75%, uh, they belong to the uh, group that has the best overall survival. And uh, the EF the, and the compliance data was independently uh, verified by another group. Uh, uh, and uh, the higher the compliance, uh, the pay- the longer the patient's uh, survival. So if you have uh, compliance of 90%, patient greater than 90%, patients uh, have a uh, longer survival compared to com- uh, compared to those with uh, low lower compliance. And the, and the minimum compliance is really hovering at about 60 to 70%. Now, um, uh, so we have applied uh, the EF14 trial applied tumor treating field after radiation and temozolomide. Uh, there has been, uh, uh, in the planning stage, uh, in which we looked at uh, tumor treating fields uh, that is going to be applied um, uh, earlier. And uh, the feasibility uh, was investigated by two teams, one at Thomas Sinjek, Thomas Jefferson University and the other team at Johns Hopkins, in which uh, tumor treating fields was applied simultaneously with um, with uh, external beam radiation and daily temozolomide. And uh, and as you can see in the lower panel, in which uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, X-ray, you can see that the arrays were applied to the head, and patients were in this uh, plastic. Um, thermoplastic uh, uh, mass uh, in which uh, they have to uh, 
allow for space for for uh, for the array in order to work. So it is certainly feasible uh, to apply uh, too much reading field simultaneously with radiation, and uh, and hopefully there will be a trial uh, uh, that's going to be open soon uh, to investigate the efficacy of applying too much reading fields earlier, uh, because there is. Uh, uh, preclinical data to suggest that too much reading fields uh, kind of um, uh, impair uh, double stranded uh, DNA breaks um, uh, repair. Uh, so uh, it may sensitize the effect of radiation on the tumor. Now, what if the um, the uh, uh, glioma or glioblastoma is located in the posterior fossa? So so far. Uh, too much reading field is indicated for supratentorial tumors. Okay, for infratentorial tumors, no one really know the efficacy of that. However, um, we just so happens that we have a patient in which uh, her glioblastoma was located in the posterior fossa and the superior su posterior fossa. It was resected. There was residual disease. The patient uh, has been on. Uh, uh, too much reading field since 2017, uh, uh, that's close to three years uh, um, uh, in combination with uh, bevacizumab. And when we perform electric field modeling, uh, 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 we see that with conventional placement of the array, uh, there was very little electric field um, penetrated into the posterior fossa. However, the posterior fossa configuration involves moving the, the lateral arrays further back and the uh, and the posterior array further down towards the neck. And when that happens, uh, there is uh, increased field delivered to the uh, uh, dorsal part of the posterior fossa. And the amount that is increased is approximately by 47%. So uh, the rock line is the conventional array. Uh, uh, electric field volume histogram and the green line is the uh, posterior fossa uh, electric field volume histogram and as you can see there's more uh, uh, area under the curve under the green line compared to the red line. So, uh, uh, so the clinical data so far indicate that too much reading field plus temozolomide is superior to temozolomide alone in newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients, side effects are similar in the two groups, and it primarily consists of uh, hematological adverse events. Scalp dermatitis is unique to tumor treating fields. Uh, one of the major criticism about the uh, randomized control trial is that the control group did not include a sham treatment. However, uh, uh, placing a sham treatment would essentially give away to the patient that uh, the patient is not getting treatment because uh, when the device is turned on, there's also heat on the scalp. Um, so uh, even though if we put on the sham treatments, it is not really uh, a blinded study. So uh, what are the clinical trials that are currently in place uh, for tumor treating fields for uh, uh, glioblastoma? Well, uh, there has been a number of investigator-initiated trials looking at the combination of epicycline and Treating fields, bevacizumab, and tumor treating fields plus their retracting radio surgery, bevacizumab and temozolomide, and tumor treating fields um, vaccines as well as checkpoint in inhibitors. Now, um, tumor treating fields is also uh, being applied to malignancies outside of the brain, notably lung cancer as well as um, pancreatic cancer as well as ovarian cancer. Uh, and in these malignancies, uh, the arrays, are, uh, there's a larger array for the chest and also the abdomen. And we can uh, perform um, uh, a finite element analysis to look at the electric field penetration. This is uh, still uh, in, in, in the infancy, but it is doable. Now, uh, uh, so here are the phase three clinical trials. Um, Metis, uh, which is a randomized phase three clinical trials for 
brain metastasis from non-small cell lung cancer. This is following the stereotype that we do surgery treatment. The LUNA trial is for uh, stage four non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, this is uh, following platinum failure. PANOVA is for uh, locally advanced pancreatic carcinoma. INNOVA is a uh, ovarian cancer trial uh, that is in combination uh, that is used in platinum resistant ovarian cancer and stellar trial uh, is uh, uh, was done and uh, and actually uh, more than cool, uh, the FDA has been uh, used in the so that's the end of my talk uh, this is our uh, clinical research team and the basic cell biology research team as well as the multi-physical so if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Now, those are very... I'm sorry about that. I was muted. That was a very interesting speech. Thank you. And we have a few questions. Uh, let's start off with the easy ones. Can it be used on pediatric patients? Well, uh, this is not approved. Uh, it is not approved uh, for use in uh, pediatric patients. Uh, uh, I can, uh, however, uh, uh, from a medical standpoint, uh, if the um, if the child has a head size that is similar to an adult, uh, it can potentially uh, be used. Uh, but. Uh, but I think the head size uh, probably um, will apply up to someone who is uh, 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 on, only to teenagers, because in infants or in children, uh, it's probably not applicable because their head size is smaller. Uh, I think uh, there are uh, certain uh, pediatric oncologists that are doing uh, uh, clinical trials investigating this. Uh, it is possible, um, but there are certain hurdles to go to go through. It is not; it's certainly not approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Do you know if it has ever been tried on DIPG? Uh, I I don't know. Uh, so certain ad adults have uh, have DIPG. Um, so, uh, and I suspect that, um, uh, but no one has investigated that in a systematic fashion that I know of. Okay, uh, two quick questions on compliance. First, how is compliance uh, defined? Say somebody has a 70% compliance. Is uh -huh. that per day, per month? How does that work? Okay, so that is average over a month on a per day basis. Okay, so 75% uh, compliance is roughly 18 hours a day. So, um, so uh, the machine actually comes in with an automatic recorder because uh, if the array is off, uh, there's no no current flows fluid, and the machine can sense that. So uh, every month, uh, the machine, the, the device specialist uh, uh, would download the um, recording from the patient's machine or do it um, uh, automatically. Uh, 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 and and uh, and uh, Novocure would determine what the compli what the percentage compliance, and then send a compliance report to the patient's doctor. Okay, and I assume you could give that to the patient if they wanted it. Right? Oh, of course, of course, uh, because uh, uh, in my experience, uh, I have patients uh, who have uh, a few patients who. Are, who were able to achieve 95 to 99 percent compliance okay uh, and there are individual patients uh, who are um, who have a compliance less than 75 percent and uh, and and obviously I in when they come back for neurological follow-up I will go over that their compliance with them okay uh, what percent compliance should they really shoot for well According to past data, uh, uh, and this is retrospective from both EF11 and EF14 trial, what has been shown is that uh, 
the higher the compliance, uh, uh, the lower the hazard ratio for recurrence, and uh, the longer the patient survival. So um, if at all possible, shoot for 90% or greater compliance. Uh, I know that it is not always possible because of a variety of reasons. Patients' familiarity of the machines and also with the, um, with the amount of help at their home or uh, uh, the patient's motivation. Uh, but uh, the minimum that is required is 75%. Okay. You mentioned the study about using it during radiation. Is it possible to use it off-label outside of a trial during radiation now? Um, well, I don't think uh, insurance companies will pay for it. Uh, your physicians can try. It, uh, it's kind of variable. It may take time to argue with the insurance company. So right now, uh, we only know two things, okay? Uh, one is that there's preclinical data to indicate that there is um, um, some additive to synergistic effects and there is a, um, a mechanistic data uh, to indicate that um, tumor treating field can potentially synergize with radiation against glioblastoma. Uh, it is uh, feasible uh, to be done. Um, but the radiation oncologist has to make permission for the extra uh, space that is required for the um, transducer arrays on the, uh, on the scalp because the thermoplastic that you saw on my um, slide presentation needs to account for the space for the transducer array within that mass that the patients uh, put on prior to the radiation every day. Okay. Uh, what is the magnitude of the survival benefit for newly diagnosed compared to like the early treatments you mentioned, like Timidon, Avast, and Gliadel? Okay, so um, uh, the EF14 trial was a direct comparison of, um, of tumor treating fields added in the adjuvant setting along with Temozolomide compared to Temozolomide alone. And that show uh, an increase in both progression-free survival and overall survival across the entire population by about, um, by about four months, okay? So um, now that is the entire population. Uh, and obviously, uh, those patients that are at the top part of the curve uh, derive uh, lesser benefits compared to patients at the tail of the curve. And I suspect that patients, uh, majority of the patients at the tail of the curve are younger patients, whereas the patients uh, at the top part of the curve are, are older patients. There are certainly other factors that I suspect that um, may, um, may be different between individuals at the tail versus the top. So, um, so, uh, so there is efficacy. Uh, to answer your second question, uh, it has not been directly compared to uh, to Gliadel, uh, uh placement, whether or not tumor treating fields is uh, better than Gliadel. How, uh, however, um, I would not recommend placing both Gliadel and tumor treating fields uh, at the same time because uh, Gliadel, um, uh, uh, when it's applied, uh, there is... Uh, some concern about wound, wound healing on the scalp and, um, and, uh, and with tumor treating fields, you have to apply the arrays on the scalp. So wound healing is a very, very important issue. So, so the, the, the patient picture that I show, uh, I am always very meticulous in terms of looking at the scar as well as whether or not there are some scabs uh, that are on the scalp on the scar because uh, you, you don't really know what is on the other side of the scab, okay? So it could be penetrating all the way down uh, uh, to the bone or, uh, or it could be uh, just superficial. So there's no way to know until you pull that scab off. And I usually don't pull that scab off and, and it's not all off. 
Um, I actually meant when each of these were approved, like Timidar, Vest, and Gliadel, they were approved based on a increase in survival, like a percentage increase over uh, what was used before. Um, what I'm getting at, what I'm getting at is, what percent increase in survival got the approval for Timidar, Vast, and Gliadel, and Optune? Do you happen to know those numbers? Um, uh, I think the improvement uh, in survival, uh, the improvement in median survival from Gliadel is approximately uh, three months, and the improvement uh, of adding Timidar to radiation is also approximately three months. And the improvement of adding uh, uh, tumor treating fields to Temadar in the adjuvant setting, uh, uh, the improvement is of about four of about four months. And Avastin? Uh, compared to Avastin? No, no. Avastin had what percentage improvement over? Uh, Avastin had no improvement in overall survival compared to, uh, to, to the control group. However, Avastin did have a, an improvement in progression-free survival by about four to six months, I, I believe. Okay. Um, let's move on to, uh, is there, well, the question is basically, why doesn't it work in all patients? It sounds like theoretically it should just work. So what is stopping it from working? And are there any factors that might be specific to a patient that would stop it from working? Uh, I think just like any kind of therapy, uh, the tumor cells will find a way around the treatment. I mean, this is true for any kind of therapy. This is true for Avastin. This is true for uh, Temadar. This is true for Lomastine. This is true for radiation. Uh, the tumor cells will adapt to the new situation and then uh, find a way around it. So I'm not surprised by uh, resistance to tumor treating fields. And the trick is to find out the mechanism of, of resistance. Ah, that was the next question. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and find therapies that, may, that can potentially um, uh, address that resistance. Now, uh, well, since you asked the question, what are the mechanisms of resistance? Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, no one uh, knows at this time. Uh, uh, but one thing that I, I, I can say is that um, um, uh, uh, because uh, this is some of the research that I have done in the past, and uh, because uh, because uh, tumor treating fields has an indirect effect on the immunology of the tumor cells. And, uh, and one of the things that can potentially um, uh, cause resistance is by weakening. Some other therapies, uh, some other drugs can potentially weaken the immune system uh, so, so that uh, the tumor cells is no longer visible to the immune system. So, for example, alkylating chemotherapy. When you apply alkylating chemotherapy for a prolonged period of time, uh, depending on what type of alkylating chemotherapy, uh, you will weaken the bone marrow, you weaken the immune system. Therefore, uh, 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 over time, uh, the patients uh, will, 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 will develop resistance disease. We could not, not because the tumor changed, but because uh, the immunology of the patients changed. Uh, the second important drug is desimethasone. So uh, I am I am uh, I am a strong proponent of patients to be on no desimethasone or minimal amount of desimethasone, uh, if possible. Uh, and if possible, less than if the patient needs it, uh, definitely less than four milligrams a day uh, of of desimethasone. So uh, over time, uh, that somethasone will also weaken the, the immune system. Uh, so, so perhaps immune system uh, uh, immunosuppression over time uh, is one mechanism that uh, that the tumor can can lead to recurrence. Uh, uh, and and some of the proteins that uh, that uh, that the uh, tumor treating field attacks uh, 
may develop, there could be secondary pathways that may develop. Uh, no one really knows at this time. That's a, um, that is a hot area for research uh, for uh, basic scientists in this field. Okay, you showed a slide with the uh, response to different frequencies. Would it help to tune the frequency, especially on patients where it's not working? So if it's not working at you know, the standard frequency, if you just tried moving it up or down a little bit, would that make a difference? And is something like that even possible? Uh, okay, 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 let me answer the second question. It is not possible. The reason is because when the Food and Drug Administration approved the device, it only approved 200 kilohertz for glioblastoma. So uh, although it is uh, possible to uh, develop a device that one can tune it with a dial to say uh, 250 kilohertz or 150 kilohertz, uh, uh, the Food and Drug Administration just would not allow it. Um, uh, is it possible to tune it uh, uh, and, and derive better efficacy is certainly possible, but just looking at the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, uh, a range of 100 to 300 kilohertz, you're not talking, this is very, very tight within the, the, the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So, um, so uh, although it's possible, I don't think it's doable at this time. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the baldness. Does that ever go away or is that permanent? No, uh, it's not permanent. Uh, the hair will come back, but usually it takes another four to six months to come back. So, so um, uh, do you remember what I said in my talk that uh, thing of this type of therapy is a wave, not okay. as a bullet, okay? Well, the effect doesn't come on quickly. The effect also does not dissipate quickly, okay? So it takes about four to six months to develop the ball spot. And it also takes about four to six months for the football spot to come back. Uh, that particular patient who I showed you, it right. took her about six months for her hair to grow back af after she came off the therapy. Okay. Do all patients get the Novotel planning? And is it just done once or is it done like whenever you see a change on MRI? Um, okay. So um, uh, the Novotel planning can be done <clears throat> by... Uh, by Novocure, or uh, in my case, I personally perform the Novocure planning. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, the, if the tumor changes, uh, 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 if I believe that uh, the patient would still derive benefits, uh, then I would perform a a new plan, uh, a repeat Novocure planning. So. Um, so uh, it is certainly possible to be planned. And then the, uh, the arrangements of the arrays would change because as I said before, uh, the arrays is rectangular. So you can um, put them on the patient's scalp with a long axis horizontal or vertical like this. So, um, so the, and there are four of them. So uh, two to the fourth power, uh, there are 16 combinations. Uh, that one can do, and also one can move the arrays a little bit diagonally. So there are multiple combinations, and the Novotel uh, planning program, planning software, is to find the best combination based on the tumor size and also the location. Okay, how long does it take up to uh, to see a difference on the MRI? And another follow-up question would be, how long should you use it? before giving up on it if you don't see a benefit? Okay. Um, I think uh, it's easier for me to address the second question because, <laughs> that, uh, uh, because we don't usually see a response on MRI scan. We see stabilization, okay? Although I did see a response in uh, a few patients uh, uh, and they are primarily partial responses, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, um, but one has to be on the up to, uh, on the tumor treating field device for approximately six months before I can declare that it doesn't work. Okay. So for those patients who are on, on, on treatment and then progress within two months, 
it is certainly possible because uh, the uh, uh, the tumors is all, all, all already in an accelerating phase of growth that the treatment is not able to catch up with it. So you have to find some means of slowing it down in order to give the treatment uh, a chance to work. So those include, those means include radiation because radiation is like a bullet. It will work faster or a vastin. A vastin will diminish the blood supply and then uh, it will significantly slow down tumor growth. And then you can have a period of time that you you can determine whether or not uh, our tumor treating field works. Uh, and the time period is approximately six months. Okay. And I assume most insurances cover it now, right? Yes. Most insurance covers uh, in the newly diagnosed setting. Um, um, uh, Medicare requires a stipulation that patients have to start therapy uh, within seven weeks from the time of, from the end of radiation. So, uh, so I think uh, the discussion needs to occur while the patient is getting radiation. Um, yeah. Okay, I just want to throw in that we have a copayment assistance program to help people who have high copayments. You could talk to me about that separately, anybody who needs it. Um, you showed that one slide where they cut away part of the skull. Is there any chance of ever developing an implantable electrodes so you don't have to even use the external arrays and you get more power? I see. Yes, uh, there are some of my neurosurgery colleagues are uh, already talking about that. Uh, there's some excitement. There's excitement in terms of uh, uh, placing an implantable uh, array underneath the scalp because uh, no, no, not underneath the scalp, but also underneath. Under the skull. Uh, yeah, on, on, on top of the brain, uh, underneath the skull. Because the skull kind of attenuates the uh, tumor treatment fields a lot. Um, so, uh, it is certainly possible, but from, a, from, from the standpoint of food and drug administration, that becomes a totally different device. True. So this requires another randomized phase three <laughs> uh, Not an easy undertaking. Can you use tumor treating fields if you have a shunt, metal plate, and or pacemaker? Uh, you cannot use it with any active device, okay, like a pacemaker uh, or a um, uh, vagus nerve stimulator or a uh, deep brain stimulator. And those are active devices. Okay? However, uh, if you have a passive device, like a ventricular peritoneal shunt, I have personally to the patients with uh, passive devices. Uh, the important thing is not to put the uh, transducers right on top of the, uh, so for example, an Omaya reservoir, um, uh, right on top of the Omaya reservoir right on top of the scalp above the reservoir. Okay, and this looks like the last question, unless we get another quick one. Uh, are there any problems with the COVID-19 pandemic as far as getting set up the first time or having the technicians come to your house or getting supplies? Um, okay, so nowadays uh, they are now doing a lot of video uh, uh, visits uh, with patients and, uh, and uh, but uh, can you still hear me? Yes, yes. So um, they, uh, the individuals uh, will, uh, the uh, device specialists uh, can still go to the home to deliver the device to the patients. And also, uh, the supplies can be mailed to the patient's home. Um, now, I'm glad that you bring up the point about uh, COVID-19 because uh, tumor treating fields is one of the therapies that does not suppress the patient's immune system. So avastin and tumor are treatments for glioblastoma patients that do not su uh, suppress the patient's immune system. So uh, alkylating chemotherapy can certainly uh, su suppress the patient's immune system a lot uh, uh, if patients take it long enough. 
Okay, we just got one more question. Is Uptune available in Canada? Uh, I am not clear. Okay, I'll, I'll find out and I'll get back to that person. Well, that looks like that's all the questions and I want to thank you uh, so much, Dr. Wang. Our well, next... thank you very much. Well, yeah. thank you everyone for attending my talk and thank you Al for inviting me. Sure, okay, our next webinar is on May 3rd, Sunday, May 3rd. Dr. Stephen Brem will be talking about combining advances in surgery and immunotherapy to maximize outcomes for patients with malignant glioma. We'll see you then. If you have any questions, you can always come to our website and ask the questions, virtualtrials.com. Thank you and have a happy Easter, everybody.